uh, it's not just observation in fact most of the biology is quantitative right not just qualitative so everything like right from if you see people think that even i used to think as a student when i was in school that if you hate numbers choose biology right and then you, <laughs> yes, you don't have to encounter numbers anymore yeah but, but then in every other subject there so is math <laughs> Yes, I was so wrong. <laughs> Everyone was. So when you, even if you become a doctor, all you see on a report is numbers, right? You yes. take any report, all you will see is numbers, <laughs> a range of numbers, and on the basis of those numbers, you have to, you know, decide what to do with this patient, what's happening to this patient. So everything has to be quantitative. Uh, because it makes sense, quantity or quantitative science takes out the chances of subjectivity for example i might think that this is okay looking at the like, let's say if so in earlier times when people used to study anything like physiology or evolution so all the pioneers of biology they were not very used to to use mathematics or numbers to quantitate biology right most of the biology started as observations so did most of the physics okay so you look look up, try to figure out what's happening. Yes, Arpit has also joined. Hello, Arpit. So you 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 good look evening. at a phenomena. Yes, good evening, good evening. How are you, Arpit? Sam, good. Sam, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. So we were just discussing how quantitative biology is very important and why in your textbooks most of so genetics. When we were studying genetics, I told you that why Mendel's work remain unnoticed for decades is because it was a very new approach that Mendel took to, to uh, define uh, biology, right? He did quantitative genetics. Before that, people knew that there is an effect of uh, inheritance, like some factors must be inheriting from parents to offsprings, and we get certain characters, right? Right from times immemorial when babies are born, People say that, okay, this baby is like the father or the baby is like the mother. So this concept was not unknown. So many a times we think that discovery leads to like the beginning of knowledge. That's not true. We often think that Newton was the first one to discover gravity. Before that, we didn't even know that what gravity is. We all knew, you know. Apples were falling from the tree right from the time of when apple trees first big, like, originated on the earth, right? Apples always fall down. It's not like before Newton, they used to go up. <laughs> yes. We knew, yeah, we knew that there is some kind of a rule governing this you know, universe. Everyone knew that something is there, that everything falls back to earth. Nothing, and to fly, you have to spend energy. So birds fly because they spend energy in flying. So all these theories are always there, but we are not taught all of it in the textbook because then it will be more philosophical. But that's how science began. So Newton, for the first time, started making a theory which is based on quantitation. So he started thinking that if the mass is this and if it is falling down in this time from this height, let me do some calculations and figure out, is it same for everything or is it different? Okay. So where you found the pull due to gravity, acceleration due to gravity, which is small g, you find that in space, any two bodies will uh, attract each other with a, with a force, which is equal to capital G, which we call the gravitational constant, which is uh, g, uh, uh, g m1, m2 upon r square, right? So all these were quantitative <coughs> signs, and that took subjectivity out of it. So you will not be biased while doing science, you will know that, okay, this is the rule and it, it works. So similarly in, in, in ecology, in evolution also, now we, we use mathematics a lot, not just in genetics. So this is what we will be studying today in population dynamics. So before that, uh, a quick summary, anyone, Arpit? <clears throat> Uh, yes, Kusum sir. has also joined. Uh, yes, uh, Arpit, would you like to give a quick summary? Yes, sure, sir. Yeah, okay. 
but before that uh, so kulsum has also joined and i i checked uh, uh, did you people get your first marks like first mocks grades no sir no okay so probably you'll be you'll be getting it soon and i just wanted to uh, say that some of you have written very very good answers like very good all all your answers every one of you knew the knew the answers that's there but uh, i always tell you that you know uh, it's not just knowledge that help you fetch good marks in boards it also presentation and it also sometimes you have to gauge that it's a two mark question it is a one marker question if it is a three marker question sometimes the answer is just a one liner or one word you know but don't write it in one word if it is a three mark question because those who are going to check your copies <clears throat> might also they also quantitate sometimes they don't only look the quality of the answer they also look the quantity of the answer so again this is one arena of life where quantitation might help you so if it is a one marker question not more than two lines if it is a two marker question not more than four lines if it is a three marker questions try to write the answer in <clears throat> four to six lines accordingly four marker a small paragraph five marker a slightly big paragraph okay so i have not um, i have not deducted marks for the first mock on that basis but uh, i will start doing it for the coming exam so that you also have a practice of um, deciding how long or how short you have to write answers and uh, kulsum has done really well in the first mock so um, well done kulsum and then matthew you have also done good thank you sir. there was there was some thing you need to improve on and you will be seasoned for for boards and finals but kulsum can you hear me i really liked your answer sheet it was very well presented like i still cannot answer that neat i think but it's great that you one of my student can okay all the best for upcoming and please give all the mocks okay every one of you okay so arpit over to you let's start with a quick summary yes sir. so in the previous class so we start with organism and population so we first discuss about what is population population is a group of organ organism living in same geographical area or a habitat sharing and competing for a similar resources and can potentially interplay and uh, then we did organism organism is individual entity capable of independent existence in ecosystem and sub part of a population so then we discuss the factors which affecting organisms there are two factors biotic factors and abiotic factors the abiotic factors were temperature water light and soil and so then we did the population dynamics attributes so we discussed what is birth rate and death rate so it is the per capita birth or death rate that happens in a given fixed population size so that is change in number in unit time upon initial population so then we discuss the sex ratio so it is defined as the number of males upon number of females in a uh, in a area given area or the second formula you told was number of females upon per thousand yeah this is we certain, this is how we do it for uh, human you know the human sex ratio in different states or countries you might have read terms like in this particular country there are uh, 998 females per 1000 males or you know 1000 females per 1000 males which is <clears throat> ideal at some places you know interestingly there are more females than males so if the sex ratio is very skewed it also tells you about many many social issues that the society might be facing because the higher the number fertilization is a is a 50 50 event right there are 50% chances of a boy and a 50% chances of a girl and let me tell you a very interesting thing you know the chances of girl child in evolution is increasing in the last um, like in the last 10000 years of human evolution because the x you know that the x chromosome is the is the tiniest sorry the y chromosome is the tiniest one and it's also the most fragile one and sperms are also more fragile 
than than ovum so what has happened over time and it's a it's a recent study that got uh, i saw the paper that uh, tells that in the last 3 4 decades uh, the average sperm count of a average male in human population has declined so because of many factors diet our exercise regime our increasing magnitude and uh, uh, and frequency of lifestyle diseases our uh, the radiation in the environment where we live in an environment which is full of radiations of all kind which might not be affecting humans but it might be affecting uh, the the gametes we we are not very sure so all these factors taken together is decreasing the number and the number is uh, if the number decreases then the chances of fertilization also decreases and among that also the sperms which are xy sorry the sperms which carry y versus the sperms which carry x uh, the, uh, the the sperms anyways are more fragile but y chromosome is even fragile so taken everything together if you make a broader picture the chances of girl child is more but if if you see uh, a state where the girl child population is very less for example there is a state in india uh, haryana this is the most skewed state for a girl child like a, a sex ratio of male to female it simply means that there are societal problems and the pro those problems are that female uh, in, in infanticide and female feticide is taking place right so that also tells us about uh, the, not just the demographics but also society or societal setup of any place okay in the wild we use this basically like for wild populations and this is also used yes sir pet <clears throat> so then we did age distribution sir so it is it means that in a given population what is a fraction of individuals of various age groups that are residing in a particular area sir so, and it is very useful uh, to prepare disease models and to and to depict the age distribution we use age pyramids and then sir you told about the following correct pyramids. yes so did you go back and looked at other kind of pyramids stable declining how does they look so can you explain them again sir because i didn't understand yeah. them yes for so declining sir it will be like pre reproductive will be lesser than uh, post reproductive yes so one shorthand rule is which um, I'll, i'll tell again is that most of the time you don't have to worry about the post reproductive population size okay you have to look between the dynamics of like i said here this is the most important thing you have to first look in a population pyramid Uh, representation if you see that the reproductive is less than the pre reproductive which means the or in other words i should say the pre reproductive population is higher in size than the reproductive population okay and even if the post reproductive population is higher than all uh, both these two still this population is going to be expanding one okay just because the shape is like this that it's broader then it becomes narrower and again become broader don't think that it's going to be stable or, or declining it will still be expanding because this particular bin of pre reproductive will in some time become reproductive and when they will be reproductive they will produce more progenies so the population will expand the only case where the population can decline is like matthew correctly said where the pre reproductive population is less than the reproductive and the post reproductive make sense arpit yes yeah so if you find a pyramid where the pre reproductive is equal to reproductive uh, okay so and post reproductive is let's say higher than both then what is going what is the population 
expanding, stable, or declining? Let me make it for you. So I think Arpit will answer this. Okay, Arpit, you will answer this. So if this is the post reproductive, and then this is reproductive, and then the same is pre reproductive. So what do you think this population is going to be? So it's stable. Yeah, it is stable, correct? Why it is stable? Because the same number of individuals are present in pre-reproductive as in reproductive. So when they will, they, there will be transition, this population is going to be stable because they will produce again the similar kind of offsprings. So they will die, correct? And the population will stabilize for some time. Make sense? Yes, sir. So I hope you understand, right? Everyone, anyone has any doubt with these kind of pyramid representations? <clears throat> okay. So if not, then let me ask you a question. So what does this tells us about age pyramid? What does it tells us about? It tells us about the population size, right? <clears throat> yes. So and, the population yeah. distribution rather. Yes, distribution. But if you just can club it together, it will also tell you about the size, right? If you know yes. the numbers, you just have to add to get to know the size. So one thing which is related or closely associated with distribution of age in population is population size. So if you don't know the population size, can you make an age distribution pyramid? Is that possible, Arpit? No, sir. So first I have to tell you that how many people are there, right? If I ask you that, uh, please go and make a age distribution pyramid chart of your school. You will first ask me that what is the total number of people in the school, right? Then only you can put them into different bins and make a pyramid chart, correct? Yes, sir. So population size is always going to be a component. So it is a major component because organism does not have like something like an organism size, like it every organism has its size but this is another attribute of population organism is one size in terms of number i'm saying so population size tells us a lot about a population if it is going to increase decrease <clears throat> population size also tells us that whether there, there is a there is a possibility of a prey predator relationship in in or or not so if i see and that there are too many deers and just two tigers in a particular area of a forest, then a prey predator relationship can settle there and it can it can it can work, right? It can be stable, like both can coexist together. Make sense? Because this is what happens normally in the forests. Deers, uh, tigers keep eating the deers, but still the deers are there. They have not gone extinct because there is a relationship. There is a fine balance between the population uh, <clears throat> sizes. So the predator population size will never outgrow or never become large. It will always be small as compared to the prey. So population size tells us a lot about the population. But every time, it's not possible to find the actual population size. For example, it might be possible if I ask you, what is the population size of stray dogs in your colony? So maybe it's countable. You can go and count all the dogs. But if I ask you, what is the population size of all the, all, uh, <clears throat> let's say, sal trees in a forest? then it's not going to be possible, right? A forest can be huge and there can be lakhs of trees. And it will not be possible for you to count every tree. But even if you become very ambitious and say that, okay, I'll start marking and I'll count every tree and I can still find a population size. Then I can say that, what about a population size of a bacterial colony on a culture plate? That is truly not possible, right? To figure out. So where population size is not possible to figure out, what do we do? Do we stop studying population dynamics? 
No, right? No, sir. <clears throat> is there is there any other way uh, through which we can get to know an indirect measure of population size? Because counting huge populations is very very time consuming, time consuming, and sometimes impossible. Right? Yes. So what do we do then? If we cannot count the number of individuals, then we cannot know the population size. Then we shift to another. We estimate the population growth. Uh, but again, to estimate population growth, you need to know the initial size and the final size. You understand? Yes, sir. How will you know that population has grown? Let's say I started with 5 million bacteria and now there are 10 million bacteria. Population has grown, but you first need to know that there were 5 million to begin with. Now there are 10 million. That's, that's where you will find no, positive or negative growth. Yes. Correct. So it seems like everything boils down to population size in population dynamic study, but that's not true. It's not the case all the time. So we, from population size, go to a concept which is known as population density. And what is population density and how is it different from size? Can you think? As the word says, density. What is density? Number of no. number of yeah you're correct just tell me density is number of anything whatever we are finding a density of it could be density of water molecules in in specific form of water like ice gas or liquid so we say that in a liquid water the atoms are more dense than gaseous water. So number enough. of people per unit. Per unit? Area. Yes, perfect. So number of individuals. Yes, you are saying something, Abhya? Or I, I think someone said something. Anyone is saying something? No? Okay. Okay. Please, please feel free to ask question at any any given point. So density is number of individuals per unit area. And for that, we don't have to like, if I tell you that go and study the population dynamics of two different kind of grasses in this forest. So grasses, so what you will do is you will choose an area. Let's say you will choose an area of 10 by 10 meter. Okay, 10 meter by 10 meter. And then you will calculate the individual, which is still countable. Like this is the grasses of population one in that area. And this is the population two, the red one in that area. And then you will, this will be your site one, sample one. You will do such random sampling at, let's say five or six different places in that jungle. And if, if, it, if in all the six different places, you find that the black population uh, which I have shown here. So the grass A type is, let's say, coming out to be always in the ratio of 6 is to 2 or you can say 3 is to 1. Okay. Which means uh, A type is always 3 times more than B type of grass in all the samples that you have studied. So this will solve your purpose. So you get an indirect measure that uh, A type grass is 3 times more in this forest. Correct. And that way you don't have to go and count each and every blade in the forest, which is not possible. So that's how we study population density. So <clears throat> in this case, we are still finding the absolute density. You know, we can, we can even work with something called relative density. So relative densities also serve the purpose like here. So if you, if you just find that A is three times more than B, that's a relative density. Okay, you don't need to you don't need to know numbers of any of the two populations at all. Does it make sense, people? You understand? Yes. 
Yes, sir. So can yep. you explain again? Yes. So I'm saying that density is a indirect measure to actually figure out population size in a way, right? So what if I tell you, let's say if I ask you to go and study the population dynamics of two different kind of grasses in a jungle. Okay, so jungle is huge. And in that jungle, counting the grass of one type versus the other type is not possible, right? Yes, so what you can do is, you can either choose a type of grass, take a small area, which will be your sample size. In that small area, one by one meter or whatever, 10 by 10 meter, you just count the number of grasses. Then you just know the total area of this forest. Let's say the forest is 200 kilometers in area, 200 kilometers square is the area of a forest, hypothetically. And you, you have to figure out, so you will figure out how much of that area is covered with grasses. Okay, let's say 50 kilometer square is with grasses. And in that, you go to make different, different sample sizes in those different, different patches. You don't have to count all the grasses. You just count uh, the density of one type. Okay. And yes, you can just extrapolate and figure out that, okay, the population density of this type of grass is this in a jungle. That is still the absolute, absolute density of type A. But we can also work with what is called as relative density for population studies where, uh, let's say grasses was one example. Let's say someone wants to study fish in a, in a lake. There, there are two species of fish and species A and species B, what is the relative abundance of these fish? So what I will do is <clears throat> I will put a net, okay? And in that net, in that given particular area, of it's a big lake. So in one net, suppose I got 20 kgs of fish and I will see that um, there are total 500 fish and 300 are belongs to uh, type one, species one, and 200 are for species two. So I will also get to know the relative density, which is density of one population in relation to the density of other population. There we don't even have to know the absolute numbers of each species, but if we know the ratio, that it always comes out to be somewhere around three is to one. So if I find uh, two fish for species A, I find six fish for species B all the time. So it is three is to one ratio. Sometimes it's seven and one, sometimes it's eight and three, but overall the ratio revolves around three is to one all the time. This is how Mendel did his genetics. You understand? That's called yes, relative sir. density. Okay. So even that works in population studies. So in so this question has come in boards one, Delhi boards, I think it's 2016 question that what is the advantage of working with population density over population size? Write down this question. What is the advantage of working with population density over population size for ecological investigations? So I hope it's clear to you. Can you can you write the answer for this? You want me to dictate? Just. Okay, so you want me to dictate? Yeah. Yeah, write down. So population density Population density need not need not to be measured need not to be measured in numbers only. A population density need not to be measured in absolute numbers only. <clears throat> Do 
बट बट even the relative densities of abundance even the relative densities of abundance of two species of two species can serve the purpose equally well can serve the purpose equally well for ecological investigations so this is a way to estimate this is a way to estimate population size indirectly this is a way to estimate population size indirectly where the absolute counting is not possible where the absolute counting is not possible okay so this is the advantage we can still continue to do population dynamic studies without knowing the actual numbers of every species we are talking about because it's not possible sometimes to know the actual numbers does the answer make sense everyone is it clear yes yeah. okay now now let's come to the concept of what i think matthew uh, touched upon population growth right matthew you you say it population growth yes sir so what do we mean by population growth first of all <clears throat> and when i when we talk about growth in scientific terms growth is not always increase okay growth is a neutral word so in in day to day life we say that growth means always you know growing up or um, like increasing in number so that is how we but in science the word growth is given for the change so there can be two type of growth a positive population po positive growth or a negative growth okay make sense so growth is just like the concept of uh, rate rate of growth or 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 acceleration you know so acceleration we always think that it's so we have given a term deceleration for negative acceleration right so similarly population growth can be of two types if a population is declining that population is a negative growth if it is expanding it has a positive growth but first of all let's define the parameters or talk about the factors before going to mathematical models of what can affect growth so what do you think contributes to population growth or population change or fluctuation in other words all these words can be used so what all factors let's say i start with i am taking any population uh, to begin with and it's a big population i don't know the numbers but still i can do the study so i will use population density to begin with and let me denote this as n okay so what else, what factors do you think can increase or decrease this density over over time would you like to try people number of people yeah. born like Migration natality of people born right yes birth and death correct so yes. we use the concept of birth and in in in, tech, in biological terms it's called the concept of natality natality is birth and uh, mortality or fatality is death okay so natality is birth and i'll write it as b because for both so that you understand so one factor is natality and how is it going to affect the population in a positive manner or a negative manner positive positive so i'll make an arrow to indicate positive 
correlation okay and then there is death or mortality also known as fatality so let's write d because it's death common terms and how is this going to affect the population positive negative. or negative so let me put a stop thing here so this is a sign for inhibition or negative feedback and this is a sign for positive feedback in biology so mortality and natality any other thing that can affect the population migration. density yes migration can affect population density a lot and that happens all the time and migration is of two type what are those two types again just like growth which can be positive or negative migration immigration, simply means immigration yes so if you go to airports you find that there is a immigration queue and emigration you know departure and arrival correct yes sir. so either you can enter into a population and if something is entering into a population that that is called immigration okay and let me write it as i so immigration is going to affect the population positively or negatively positively yes it is a positive effect because it will add individuals into the population and the other thing is emigration so yes so this population density can vary very like on a re, uh, like what's the ana are you there arpit yes sir i am like searching for the exact word so right. are you saying that the population density can vary very very fast yes yeah like with many, because there are many factors it can keep varying so it is it's because it is like dynamic. this happens very continuously right? exactly so it does vary okay population density does vary but the point is not that how each factor is working out point is what is the overall effect so let's say there is more birth and then death so you will think that oh then it is a sure sign that the population is going to expand right but still if there is more emigration along with more birth it can still stabilize the population correct yes if the birth rate and death rate like becomes equivalent no no not just birth rate let's say birth rate is more so more people are adding into the population okay and death rate yes. is less so less people are dying so you will think that the population is going to expand but because there are other factors also like emigration and immigration so let's say people are taking birth more but also people are leaving that population more so what will happen to the population it will become constant not very it will stabilize without changing the mortality rate right yes we don't have to make the mortality rate equivalent to natality rate all the time to stabilize a population in wild you understand what i'm saying yes sir make sense yes sir okay right. so it is a very dynamic a system but still there are long term stabilization effects or declining effects or expanding effects that we see so given these concepts let me try to say that if i want to model mathematically the population growth with these given terms can i do it so population growth means i want to find what what happened to the population uh at a successive time point so let's say in 2022 i know that this is the population density of tigers in india okay now i want want to find in 2023 so 2023 for me so this is population density in 2022 so n of 2022 which is like t at which i am studying is equal to i want to find n at 2023 which is t plus 1 right time t is time i can take any time month day minute if i am st studying bacteria it can be minutes and hours but at any successive time point which is t plus 1 
this one can be anything one year one minute one hour how you define this t it depends on that so if you say t is generation 0 then t plus 1 is generation 1 t plus 2 is generation 2 if you say t is uh, uh, one hour then t plus 1 is two hours you understand everyone yes so nt plus 1 is equal to nt and what it will depend on plus It will depend on all these factors. So how should I write all these factors? How should I incorporate? Plus, let me first write whatever is adding birth plus immigration and subtract from it what is declining the population, which is death plus emigration. Does this formula make sense to you? NT plus one is equal to NT plus birth plus immigration minus death plus emigration so if this factor is more if death and emigration when combined together is more than birth plus immigration then the this whole bracket will be negative right yes sir. and a positive so and a negative population. yes and a positive negative under the bracket when it will open what it will become plus minus is minus so you will get nt plus one is equal to nt minus something right so it will always be less than nt what it was at the point when you started the study so it will be a declining population make sense people some bit of math but i think it's basic very basic yes and if uh, birth plus immigration is more then what you are uh, subtracting from it will be less so it will be a positive number here under the inside the bracket so it will be a expanding population correct yes sir and if somehow this balances out and there is no difference let's say when you minus it becomes uh, zero then nt plus zero is just nt so at the next time also you will have the same population as it you had on the previous time so that's a stable population does that make sense everyone and is it clear any doubts in this formula so we can create a numerical on this yes you can that's why I'm, we are discussing the mathematical models so this is just the basic let me go to the models now is this part clear everyone population growth yes sir. and this is the this is the only most conceptual part of this chapter so just play pay attention to this <clears throat> now let's go to let me tell you two kind of growth models that mathematical computational biologists have come up with and it is study widely so let's go to growth models you're only afraid of something if you don't understand it that's very well let me tell you from my experience and to just tell you because i'm also studying a lot of things right now we we keep studying throughout the life you you know you you never know everything i just know more than you so that i can teach you so you can be a teacher for a for a fifth grader or a sixth grader a sixth grader can be a teacher for a nursery or a kindergarten right it's just how it works so i'm just a little senior in in the field of education than you are but i'm just telling you from my experience that I thought that mathematics is very haunting and you know to get to avoid it i chose biology and i realized oh biology needs it more than or as much as any other field needs mathematics right because we have to do quantitative things so in my phd i started uh, i took a course on computational and mathematical biology which include models so the same model I'm teaching you was taught to me in a more rigid computational way where we had to model populations, predict what's going to happen on a computer software program. And the basic concepts are same, okay? And I did pretty well in, in a course being, being a very, like by training and by education, being a very, very hardcore biologist, I did very good. I, I got a overall A minus grade in the course i'm quite happy with that okay so, so a minus yeah a minus that it's like yeah a minus is like that. a plus a and then a minus so, a, yeah. so there is a, a and there's a and a minus there's no a plus 
uh, in, in oh, yeah, university. Yeah. So it's A because it already tells you that it's positive. A minus is, I think it's it's divided like if you're somewhere between 95 to 100 or 90 to 100, it's A and just five percentage below that is A minus, then B plus and B and then C plus and C and so on. So A minus is not, it's it's a good grade, right? A respectful, yes. respectable yeah. grade to get into competition where I studied all these models in a lot, very lot of detail, not just the models, but a lot of other things like chaos in population. How can you predict chaos? How can you model chaos, epidemiology, vaccines? And, uh, you know, all these vaccine programs, I got to know, they don't aim to vaccinate 100% of population ever because that's not possible. Some people will just, because we all are, we all are humans, we all have our rights. Some will say that I will not take vaccines. Now you cannot give that person vaccine forcefully, right? But if some people don't take vaccine, will the whole vaccination thing fail? That depends on many factors, including how virulent the bacteria or the virus is, how, how fatal it is, and uh, what, is the, what is the success or the protective rate of vaccines that we have. So we have calculated that for COVID, even if we manage to vaccinate, more than 65% of population. So the rest 35% will get herd immunity because of those 65%. And we can still eradicate like the pandemic. And that's all possible because of these computational or mathematical biology modeling. So yes, so don't be afraid of it. It's very, it's, it's straightforward concept. In the beginning, it may not look simple or easy, but if you pay attention, it will be, okay? If I could learn it, I believe anyone can learn it, okay? So just know that the one who's teaching you also got to learn a lot of things just recently about growth models. Okay, so the two type of growth models that we will be studying here, one is called exponential growth, okay? And you might be knowing that what does the word exponent or exponential means in mathematics? Let me give you a hint. This type of growth is also known as uh, geometric growth. So what does the word geometric means? From mathematics, geometric number series or exponential number series, what does it mean? Give me an exponential number series, exponential growth. If I start with one individual, and if I want to grow this population exponentially, so if I want to grow this population linearly, let's say there is there is something called linear growth. So from one, it will be two, from two, it will be three, from three, it yeah, will be Yeah, but exponential will be like one, two, four, eight, like that. Yes, so exponential will be one, then from one, it doubles to make two, then this doubles four. to make four, sorry. And this doubles to make? Six, eight, 16. Four, yeah. 16. Then 16. 30, and 30, then 32. 64. So what you're seeing here is the number is increasing rapidly, right? Because the yes. factor that you are taking up is two. So everything is doubling in the next generation. And do you see this kind of growth anywhere in biology? One example. PCR. Exactly. Perfect. So I was not uh, I was just expecting... thinking about that. Exactly. I was not expecting PCR as an answer, but that's um, amazing. That's an exponential growth of uh, uh, DNA strands. But you also see this growth in bacterial population. Correct? And this is simply because bacteria reproduces by binary fission. So one bacteria divides into two to give rise to two daughter bacteria, correct? Then they grow to size and each one gives rise to two daughter bacteria, correct? So from one, you become two, then four, and then eight, then 16, correct? Yes. Sir. So this kind of population growth um, is called exponential population growth. Okay, so this is linear growth. And this is called exponential growth or geometric growth. 
Now, one thing is very clear that in an exponential growth, in a very small time, the population size can grow to a very large size, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. And how is it, when is it possible? Now, can you think that uh, when is this kind of growth possible and when it can be sustained? Any idea? So when there are no factors which are affecting the growth. Exactly. Perfect. And let me elaborate what Arpit is saying. In an ideal habitat where there is no constraint on food, there is no constraint on resource availability or space. Correct? Only then you can continue to grow exponentially. Okay? So you have... So from when one bacteria started in that culture plate, it had enough food for one. When 5 million bacteria were there on the culture plate, there is enough food for 5 million and enough space for them. So then they will keep on growing and growing exponentially. Okay? So this is a very ideal condition and it is called um, unimpeded growth. Unimpeded means that there is nothing in the habitat to limit the growth or to curtail the growth. So there is no factor uh, affecting the growth and we also sorry. assume, yes, yes. Tell no, me. sorry, sir, you can complete this. Okay. So, and you can, we also assume for this time of the type of a growth that there is no sudden uh, mass death and that or the death rate is not affecting the population size because if you say that one became two two became four but from that four one died so it is technically three not four then three became six it will never became eight and from that six also from that six also if one died one second. give me one moment people i have to just just give me one second okay Hello, am I audible, people? Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so uh, if you are taking death as a factor, then for, let's say from two, something became four and one died, so it's three. So now three can double up to become six, not eight. And from there also, even one died, it is five. Then five will become 10. It will never be 16. It will be very less than that. And from that also, if one died, so you see the growth will curtail. It will not be that exponential. Make sense? So we assume that all of these are living and growing. So population is just shooting up. So that's called exponential growth. Now by, by this time, through all my um, statements, you must have already realized that this type of growth is not possible in a natural, a real scenario. Is it possible? Is it so ever a That was a my question. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that was a question, which is a very good question. And that that's not possible in a natural habitat. So it's never possible that you have unlimited resources. The earth itself is limited. How then, how can there be unlimited resources? Then why do we study this growth model at all? We should discard it, right? Exactly. Exactly. But still we study it because in the initially, in like initially when any population start, it has the uh, potential to expand exponentially not for deers or tigers or humans, but it is very important to understand bacterial infections and viral infections. So viruses and bacteria grow exponentially in our body in the beginning. After one point of time, when they have infected the body so much that the body itself is no longer, you know, uh, unlimited or sufficient, then only their growth goes down. So it's very important to study this model and understand this model because we have to fight a lot of microbes that have the potential to grow exponentially in the beginning for many generations, grow into billions and billions of numbers, and then only they start declining. Okay? Yes. Sir. Clear? Yeah. That's why we are not discarding it, Arpit. They have to fight lots of okay. pandemics. Uh, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so write down uh, about exponential growth model. Assumptions or factors for exponential growth models. This question comes. First is, 
there has to be unlimited resources available in the habitat there has to be unlimited resources available in the habitat and resources like food and space the most important food space now let's try to model it mathematically let's try to write some mathematical equation for this in second assumption write down death does not affect the population density now <clears throat> to model this we will build on this very simple thing that we studied so this is the simple thing we decided now we'll build on this now what i have to find is change in the population right now in physics or mathematics you must have read of this term d over dt of yes, anything sir. right what does it means what does d signifies yeah what does d signifies it's called it's called differential equation d over dt is d means delta you can also denote as triangle right delta s over delta t or you can write so it triangle as is for average ds by dt and this is for like very minute and yes right but it means delta which means change right triangle is when you are keep taking more than one factor into consideration and you are just some you as you are saying summarizing it not always average but how how big or small the change is but d over dt is change okay now whatever i take let's say i take n n is the population density remember yes yeah so let's build on it so i want to find the change in the population density of any organism which is growing exponentially so i've already assumed that things are unlimited and it's growing exponentially now how will i find it it will be equal to n which is the initial population density to begin with right that will always be there multiplied by birth rate minus death rate okay or if you want to make it which your ncert does not do but because you know now i have learned it so i can do it for you birth rate plus immigration rate minus death rate plus emigration rate but here you have to use the term rate now what ncert has done is it has taken this dn by dt is equal to n the initial population size into b minus d so in consider that everything that is adding to the population is b coming in birth rate and everything which is taking from the population is d and here the important thing you have to remember is n is the initial population density b is the birth rate okay it also includes anything that adds to the population like immigration let's say but it's rate and d is death rate now what is one difference that you straight forward see in this equation when you compare it to the equation we have written above here what is one straight forward difference you can see both at the same time now can you see something straight forward a difference yes yes what is it instead of like calculating both like natality mortality and all like we straight away oh. take the births and that so we are multiplying yes look at the sign here and the sign here oh yes here we are adding correct because this is a very yeah. simple model we began with so we could count the birth count the immigration count the death count the emigration and we are adding it to the 
previous population that's how this absolute number comes but as i told you it's not possible to count every birth sometime that has taken place or every immigration that has happening in the population right so instead of taking absolute birth in terms of numbers we take their rate birth rate and how do we find that rate i already told you about that here remember we were finding this rate from 50 yes. to 60 it is change which is like 10 over 50 so the rate will be 0 0.2 correct a little maths people so 50 tigers became 60 tigers in the next year so if i have to calculate this what i will ch check is what is the rate of change in this population then i will take 10 which is change in number of number in unit time which it's is 10, 10 by 50 initial population by 50 so what will be the rate 0 0.2 correct yes yes yeah so by this rate this population is changing now we go here and we take this as rates birth and death rate that's why we are multiplying make sense everyone yes sir. yeah very good so okay blue only so another thing that we will do to this equation the beauty of mathematics is you can assume take something as let's take x as this you know that's how you define mathematics so if i say that dn over dt is equal to i take b and d because this is the only factor which is within the brackets that is going to affect this n right the initial population yes or no yes so if i take it as one unit which is r so b and d is taken as r now what is what does r means for one population if i study it over time i will know that this population is expanding declining or stable and there will be a constant r constant birth minus death th thing for it unless and until it changes so most of the time when i say that there's a bacterial population growing on a culture plate with a factor of two so which means every generation it's doubling so the r there is two so if i start with 100 bacteria and if i multiply it with two the dn by dt you know i will get the change you understand what will be the change see it is a change dn by dt is the change it is not the number that i will get in the next generation it is a change that i will get which i have to add to n does it make sense people yes sir yes yeah so if i take it as r this r now will be known as so here r is equal to intrinsic growth rate it could be positive or negative growth rate of the population also some books write it as intrinsic rate of intrinsic means something which is which is like given which is a characteristic feature of the population very itself. small uh, not very small but something which is uh, the cause of which is from within the population birth and death intrinsic and extrinsic factors okay so intrinsic rate of natural increase this is also known as that because most of the time we are talking about increase it could also be intrinsic rate of natural decrease if the population is declining so that's why intrinsic growth rate is a good term to use so r becomes intrinsic growth rate right whatever is so coming back to the tiger population you remember the numbers now 50 60 in one year okay and what was the r there what was the factor by which it was changing 0 0.2 correct so if i want to find the change dn by dt of that population are you understanding people what i'm saying i am referring to this question yes sir. yeah so we already found the r which was 0 0.2 so if i want to find the change and i started with 50 what what will i multiply it with 0 0.2 Two. what will be the answer 
10. So I got that the change was 10. Now I can add it back to this population and get to know n t plus Same. 1. Correct? Yes. So this is how this formula works. Make sense, people? So this is this is giving us the change dn by dt. So now we come to our final formula, which is dn by dt is equal to rn. So this is the final formula. dn by dt is equal to r dot n. Dot means multiplication, right? Simple. So this is the formula we can use for exponential growth because the only thing which affects exponential growth, as you said, as Arpit said, is R, how, how much it is changing with. No death is affecting, there is no other factor. So this it will be applicable for exponential growth. Okay, once you fix the R, the population will keep increasing and increasing. And how will the graph look? If I want to plot a graph where this is time, it could be generation, hours, years, everything. And this is N. So this is called population density. So this kind of graph is called N versus T graph. Population density versus time graph. So it will look like this. In the beginning, it will be zero. So it will never be zero. There should be one individual. So one, then two, four, eight, 16, and then it will go very high, very fast, right? Correct? With less time, there will be more change in the number yes. because it's exponential. So this kind of graph looks like a J shape, right? So it's called J. Yes, it has a it's high, steep, it's very steep. Yes, it's called J shaped curve. And it is a characteristic feature of exponential growth of this formula. Please draw and write all of this. I give you four or five minutes and then we'll move forward. I'll give you a question also. Okay, I'll take a small quick washroom break. Okay, people, I'll be back in a minute. Right. So this. Okay. Am I audible people? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is everything clear to everyone? Anything you want to ask? Any doubt in this exponential growth model? 
Sir, I had a doubt. Yes. Sir, I was thinking like you told that uh, bacterial growth is example of exponential growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but sir, uh, factors like moisture and temperature still first test, na. So it it yes, can affect yes. the growth. Correct. You're right. So and uh, even if these factors are not there, after some point of time, every bacterial population goes into a lag phase and a log phase. So there is a log phase, then it goes into a lag phase and a stationary phase, right? It always saturates. In any given volume, you cannot keep on growing bacteria forever. There will be a time after which bacteria will start dying. Okay. Okay, sir. So you're right. You're right. But point is. in the beginning it is exponential okay bacteria only grows if the factors are uh, favorable for it and till the factors are favorable it grows exponentially and hijacks the whole system so that's why i said it's not going to hold true even for a bacteria in a long run but it will be very true for the infection you know because all we have to worry about if i can figure out the rate of growth of the population or rate of infection that's why we find these rates right the positivity rate for covid is this the fatality rate is this how do you find this rate then we make a graph we see that if the graph is too steep it is something to be worried about if the graph graph is very less steep on the basis of the rate we can still overcome and you know take cautions uh, vaccinate and do things you understand so you must also have read that some strains of covid like omicron are more infectious but some strains which were uh, in the beginning alpha and delta beta delta they were more deadly less infectious but more deadly more lethal correct we yet do not have a complete data for omicron's new variant that is out uh, it just started a new surge in china are you are you know about it Omicron BF dot seven, BF dot seven is the new variant that's causing a new surge in China, and that variant has been found in many other countries. Regardless, so it's also found in India now. So that is even more transmissible and infectious, it seems. So the if you see the infection curve for that strain, it will be even more steeper. Sir, it can so, spread with the way it had earlier. Uh, it can spread. Is it with, possible? With what? So, like when it was previously spread, like we got one lakh cases per day. It can even go beyond that. If like, but point is, we are also now immune, right? We have a yes. herd immunity, and uh, yes, these viruses have small, small mutations, but some factors might be same, and if we, if we, um. might have made vaccine against the right spike protein the right thing to target maybe we can uh, our immune system can recognize more than one strain it's always true that's how we make vaccines right sometimes viruses mutate and evolve in a way where they make the previous vaccine ineffective but that's where a cocktail of vaccines come a booster shot come or even experts now are saying that we should also give a chance to protein vaccines instead of instead of just giving our mrna so till now we are giving mrna vaccines right you know that so yes it worked yeah so what if you give protein vaccines like you directly put the protein of that virus just the protein of the protein coat or the spike protein you know something which is crucial then it will be even faster because our system will not have to translate and make the proteins okay <clears throat> uh, yes yeah, but there are many other things yes but anyways uh, but did you get the answer for your question arpit do you understand yes sir arpit yes sir okay cool so that's exponential growth and something um uh, mm, on top of it we have to study something which is called logistic growth so logistic growth i'll i'll start in the next class i want i urge you all to go and read on logistic growth i'll just tell you the concept of it and there is one more thing about exponential growth which i have to tell you is the is something called integral form of the exponential equation so this equation is 
differential form because it's d by dt correct there is an integral form also where we uh, find it in terms of nt nt is equal to so you will find one form of this equation in your ncrt which is called nt is equal to n naught into e raised to power rt where r is again this rate constant t is time e is the base of natural log the value of which is 2.72 2.72 if i'm not wrong so this is called the integral form of the same equation exponential equation only we will talk about this in the next class plus we will talk about logistic growth model this is the more appropriate and realistic growth that we see in nature and the factor which was 